I felt fairly substantially sick on safe theme park rides in my time. <laughs> have I told this story before? I'm sure I have, and people in the comments are going to be like, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze, where I, your host, Simon, read a script that someone else has written because I'm uh, lazy and I, I don't know how to write. I mean, I do know how to write, just not very well. Definitely not going to do it well enough to do it professionally. I can barely speak well enough to, to do it professionally. Today, we're reading a script written by the wonderful Danny Salter. Action Park, the lawless family theme park of doom. Uh, let's just jump into it, shall we? Take a moment to consider the poor citizens of the once great township of Vernon before it got smothered by overregulation and pizza joints. I'm really sorry to anyone who's called Vernon, but I feel that name is far too close to the word vermin to be like nice. And also, isn't it the name of the dad in Harry Potter who is kind of a <laughs> Oh God, Sam. Uh, do the crow sound or whatever over the the dick because YouTube have become such nazis and also do the crow sound over the word nazi and also that one it's going to be very confusing for anyone watching at home but YouTube have become very strict about the cursing policy in the beginning of the video so just to be safe we're playing it safe no more saying cuss words it is not good there is something missing from Vernon today, and I'm not even talking about a half-decent education system. What I'm talking about is Action Park. Why don't they make proper hardcore theme parks like this anymore? Well, <laughs> Danny, because of liability issues and uh, litigious individuals and uh, death, people don't want to die or get severely injured when they go to the theme park. I mean... It'd be kind of fun though, right? Just you like knowing you're on the edge of danger, like actual danger, because you go on a theme park ride and you're like, I mean, other than that time at Thought, was it Thought Park or uh, maybe it wasn't Thought Park. I'm sorry, Thought Park. Um, maybe it's Alton Town. It was one of the big theme parks in the UK. Like some people's legs got crushed or something. And you're like, whoo, holy sh I thought these were safe. And they are safe because, you know, that's the only incident that anyone remembers about dangers at a major theme park. Tis but a scratch. A scratch? Your arm's off. No, it isn't. Well, what's that then? I mean, other than all the people who die at Disney. <laughs> I don't have to say allegedly there. It's usually like accidental deaths, and it's definitely not the Disney Corporation's fault in any way whatsoever. They are completely innocent and fine and never do anything wrong. Allegedly. <laughs> Well, it turns out there might be one or two or six or tens of thousands of semi-credible reasons exactly. The legendary businessman Gene Mulverhill, the self-proclaimed Walt Disney of New Jersey. <laughs> I don't know much about New Jersey, but people <laughs> on New Jersey. It's the place New Jersey Shore. New Jersey Shore comes from or just Jer it's just Jersey Shore, right? Where you have these like people doing their Jersey Shore. <laughs> I've never seen it, but I know it's trashy. Oh! I, you just know. When something's called Jersey Shore, I know nothing about New Jersey. I know nothing about Jersey Shore. But you know it's trashy people doing trashy things. You just know it. And I'd probably love it. Like, you know, just one of those shows that you watch and you're like, oh God, it's so bad. It's good. I recently heard a show called like The Milf Hunter or something. Well, no, not The Milf Hunter. Isn't that like a porno series from like the 1990s? I definitely remember Milf Hunter from my childhood. And by childhood, I mean teenage years, not literally being a child, although you are a child in your teenage years, I suppose. So I wasn't incorrect. It just sounded weird when it came out of my mouth like that. With Milf Mansion, Milf Manor, the Milf Manor or Milf Island or something like this, where there's all of these milfs. <laughs> feels weird using the word MILF as a 30-something-year-old man. There's all these MILFs, and they go onto this island, and then there's all these young, attractive men who go onto this island. And the, 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 the crazy thing is, it's their children, it's their sons. Like, not, and, and the idea is that they'll be dating each other's sons, and I'm like, this is fucking mental. Whoever came up with this is a absolute genius, and also somehow, like, knows exactly what sort of trashy TV everybody wants. Because even I was like, maybe we should watch the MILF Island. <laughs> My wife was like, we're not watching MILF Island. So I was like, oh, come on. Oh my god, okay, let's move on. Did we get all of that from a prompt Walt Disney of New Jersey? Jesus Christ. <laughs> we're never gonna finish this. I just got back from vacation, so I feel like I've got a lot to share. Don't do it. 
A rad company called Great American Recreation, which first snapped up the Vernon Valley Great Gorge ski area in 1972, but Gene was already thinking bigger than just ski slopes. He shrewdly envisioned a massive adrenaline pumping all weather theme park in which the customers were largely in charge of their own thrilling experiences and the owners couldn't be held liable for potential accidents. The opening day of this newly christened Action Park in 1978 was a typically classy affair. Get the feeling it's not going to be classy. This is happening in New Jersey, home of Jersey Shore, with notable highlights including a Dolly Parton lookalike contest and a tobacco juice spitting competition. I was fucking right. And things just got better from there. By the early 1980s, Action Park was split into three sections Alpine World, Water World, and Motor World, featuring a total of 75 different attractions, including 40 water slides and 32 funky motorized rides. At its peak in the mid 80s, the park was pulling in over 20,000 people every weekend. That feels like quite a lot. Although it was heavily promoted on TV as a fun and wholesome family day out, Action Park was viewed by many thrill-seeking youngsters as a rite of passage, prompting the fond expression, you know you're from New Jersey, oh, and you've been seriously injured at Action Park. Ah, oh, that old classic. It's true that the park was a bit rough around the edges and there were a few cut corners here and there, but genius Gene had no truck with such trivialities as health and safety or unreasonable customer survival expectations. And yes, there were hundreds of reported injuries every year throughout the glorious 18-year triumph of Action Park from between 1978 to 1996. And it's likely there were a hell of a lot more unreported injuries. And sure, there were six deaths, oh god, <laughs> including three on the same attraction. After the first death, I feel like you should make sure there are no deaths again. On the second death, they'll be like, well, that attraction's getting shut down. And on the third death, well, it would have never happened because on the second death, it got shut down because I feel like that's basic health and safety. This was still up and running in 1996? Really? But that's just how they roll in New Jersey. If you can't stand the freezing cold temperatures, get out of the water park, especially when you can't even swim. Not every single attraction was a rip-roaring success or conceived on any remotely logical level. For example, the Cannonball Loop was a bit of a non-starter. It was a long, thin water slide with a surprising twist in the shape of a 360-degree loop-the-loop stuck right at its end before you hit the water. Can you do a fucking loop-the-loop on a water slide? <laughs> how fast are you going? Not the kind of thing you'd usually expect to navigate at the end of a water slide. Jean had jotted the initial design down on a napkin, possibly after feeling inspired by the kind of physics presented to him in an episode of Roadrunner, and then got the attraction quickly knocked up by a group of local welders. The problem was that the force of water wasn't always enough for the rider to build up enough momentum to safely complete the loop. I mean, I feel that that just feels fucking obvious, to be honest. This meant that you could get stuck inside the loop as the next rider was hurtling down the slide beside you. Oh, at least it was a closed water, because you've got water slides which are open top, and then you've got closed ones, so at least there was something to catch you rather than just, like, falling down onto the... The, uh, the water slide below and crippling yourself horribly. At which point things got a bit messy, but Gene was no fool before letting the attraction loose on the public. He got his own young children to test it out for any potentially life-endangering issues. Wow, this guy should be like the, the sulk of uh, New Jersey. He was the guy with polio, right? He tested that vaccine on his own kids or something like that. <laughs> Holy sh**. Yeah, but this is a theme park. It's not polio. One's going to win you the Nobel Prize. The other's going to win you... Well, nothing. <laughs> There's no prizes for that. Or maybe they are, but they're shit. <laughs> Admittedly, he did this after he'd carried out experiments with crash test dummies, many of which came out dismembered at the other end. Get in there, kiddo! <laughs> During later testing phases, he was offering his park employees $100 each to risk life and limb by trying out the cannibal loop for themselves, one of them later claiming that $100 did not buy enough booze to drown out that memory. Some of the test riders were emerging from the water with cuts and scratches, which had Jean puzzled for a while, but this smart guy soon got to the bottom of it. The riders were simply lacerating themselves on the knocked-out teeth of previous testers that had become embedded in the tube of the loop. Oh my fucking god, that is so insane. Even though Gene decided to put an emergency hatch into the loop to serve as an emergency exit and later invited a priest to bless the slide, because that'll do a lot. Do you care to pay your respects? Holy crap, you are creepy as sh The cannibal loop was largely mothballed after just a month of tears and several bloody noses. A couple of the attractions proved to be popular for all of the wrong reasons. Surf Hill was another water slide divided into a side-by-side -side line to provide a racing element, but the sheer force of hitting the water at the bottom was often powerful enough to cause a painful injury and rip off your swimwear. Oh! 
Oh, that's like doing going off the diving board without making sure that you've tightened your swimming shorts. Like, no one does that because they will end up floating in the pool somewhere and you have to nakedly navigate underwater to try and find them. No one does that. Never one to miss an opportunity, Crafty Dreen erected a cafe near the bottom of Surf Hill where customers could just hang out all day and observe teenage riders either passing out or losing their bikinis. Or both for the double whammy. Dude. <laughs> Meanwhile, the battle action tanks in Motor World was a popular was popular with guests, but not so much with park employees who would dread getting posted on this one. The basic premise was similar to bumper cars or dodgems, but guests here were invited to climb inside tanks mounted with cannons and trundle slowly around a small link fence cage while firing tennis balls at the sensors placed on the other tanks. A direct hit would cause the other tank to spin around for a while and occasionally induce vomiting from the riders. Well, that's okay. This seems pretty normal. Like induced vomiting. I felt fairly substantially sick on safe theme park rides in my time. <laughs> have I told this story before? I'm sure I have, and people in the comments are going to be like, <laughs> no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. Simon, we've heard this story like 19 times. Shut the <laughs> f*** up and get up with the story. The, 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 the script. I, I went to Mexico, and there's a Six Flags in Mexico, and I went with a group of my mates, and it was empty. Like, it was a theme park. There were maybe 50 people there, and it was a whole Six Flags. It was like my childhood fantasy come true. Like, I'm, I love theme parks, and I love theme parks as kids. And I remember, the, but you have to queue forever, and you'd be like waiting, waiting, and then you'd go on a ride, you'd be like, this is the best, and then you'd queue again, and it sucks, and you'd maybe do like five rides the whole day. This Six Flags was fucking massive, and we'd ride, I'd be like riding on the uh, the thing, it would the, the roller coaster, it would go all the way around, and the guy in the control hub would be like, you guys want to go again because there's no one waiting? And then we'd go, and even if we got off and went round again, there were signs like, three hours queue from this point, and we'd just be running. <laughs> just be running to get to the top again because there was no one there. God, it was it, literally like up there with the birth of my first child, the birth of my second child, my wedding day. The birth of myself. All of those rank slightly second to the day I went into an empty six flags. God, it was glorious. If you're going to be asked to get inside a tank, you could still join in the perfectly harmless fun by using the stationary cannons scattered around the edges of the small arena. However, the issue here was that the employees regularly had to dart around the cage to deal with a crash or pick up tennis balls or clean up fresh vomit. And this, of course, meant that everyone using those stationary cannons had no interest whatsoever in shooting the tank sensors. Oh, no. They were just there to... <laughs> God, it's funny. <laughs> to relentlessly pelt the... <laughs> <laughs> to relentlessly pelt the employees with tennis balls at every opportunity. No. <laughs> Some of the staff might have dreamed of just picking up loose teeth and dismembered body parts over on the cannibal loop. However, other rides became the stuff of the legend. The Alpine Slide was a 2,700 foot long toboggan style ride on which the riders hopped inside a cart at the very top and then went hurtling down the winding tracks made of concrete and fiberglass and asbestos. <laughs> <laughs> with no helmet and no safety gear. With very little control over their speed, one regular visitor defined the Alpine Slide as essentially just a giant track to rip, rip people's skin off that was disguised as a kid's ride. <laughs> What's it do? Oh, I remove skin. Like, like a graze? No, 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 no. It literally flays you. The slide was so big that you needed to take a ski lift to get to the top, but this ski lift passed directly over the slide, meaning that cart riders below would often get spat on or have heavy objects lobbed at them by the idiots in the ski lift above, who didn't seem to comprehend that it would be their turn next. Yes, it's like, bro, you are up. You're going to be down there in like 30 seconds. <laughs> After being drenched in spit, some of the cart riders would later end up coming off the tracks and crashing into trees or getting involved in a gruesome pileup. Between 1985 and 1986 alone, the Alpine Slide led to 26 reported head injuries and 14 reported fractures. Things were so bad, the graphic warning signs featuring photographs of injured kids were displayed at the top of the slide, but a warning sign wouldn't have been sufficient to save the life. Oh God, and now we get into death, which is not funny. Uh, save the life of 19-year-old George, George Larson Jr., whose cart suffered a steering malfunction in 1980 
throwing him off the cart and down the embankment for 25 feet until his head struck a rock. He died after spending eight days in a coma. It's often reported that George was a park employee, but his mother disputes this. She claims that Jean only tried to make out George was an employee because this meant that state authorities wouldn't need to immediately be informed about his death. Um, what? They're going to find out eventually, and uh, it's still going to be a bad time for you. At least I hope it's going to be, because... You need to uh, take out your wallet for this one, mate. George's life was the first to be lost at Action Park, but it was not the last. In 1982, another tragedy occurred on the kayak experience when 27-year-old man was flipped out of his tipped boat. He stumbled onto a metal grating which was exposed to a live wire, and the subsequent electric shock led to a fatal cardiac event. Wow, when we're talking about that, I just assumed he was going to drown, but no, he got electrocuted, which is worse. Meanwhile, over on the Tarzan swing, in which you swing over a deep pool on a 20-foot cable before letting go and landing with a splash, another guest died in 1984 when he suffered a heart attack after landing in the freezing cold spring water. But the action park attraction, with the biggest death count of all, Jesus Christ, <laughs> there's so many people, was the tidal wave pool, which became more commonly known by locals as the grave pool. Oh my god. The eight-foot deep freshwater mechanical wave pool was one of the first of its kind. It could hold up to a thousand people at a time. But the force and height of the waves could take people by surprise in a packed pool where escape was difficult. It didn't help that many of the visitors came from low-income urban areas and never really had an opportunity to learn how to swim. Yeah, I really... <laughs> it was one of those moments. You know when you're like, oh yeah, no, I am privileged. When I'm like, yeah, of course I know how... Someone, I was talking to... It was ages ago, I was talking to someone, I was like, of course I know how to swim. And they're like, well, what do you learn at school? It's like, yeah, we learned at school, but I also had like private swimming lessons like because it's important to learn how to swim and then i'm like ding oh oh i see <laughs> it's kind of weird to have private swimming lessons <laughs> i'd go to a pool every weekend and be a swimming instructor teaching me how to like swim effectively i'm quite good at swimming now <laughs> which is nice <laughs> Critics were concerned that the pool was way too deep and the waves were way too powerful. Even cautious guests who were just dipping their toes in the shallow section would often get ruthlessly sucked into the strong riptide generated by the huge pressure chambers. Fortunately, there was always a minimum of 12 lifeguards on duty at any one time, and they were kept pretty busy as they undertook as many as 30 life-saving rescues over the course of a typical fun-packed weekend. I once did my lifeguard training. I never was a lifeguard. But I did the training. It was uh, it was pretty useful. I um, I don't want to say that I once saved someone's life because that sounds very grandiose. But I went swimming with my friend. We were like, let's swim out to the island over there. And uh, yeah, I was like, I can easily do this. And he was uh, easily overconfident. And I had to do the old uh, thing back to shore because <laughs> he couldn't make it. Um, God, I haven't thought about that in a long time. But tragically, three people aged between 15 and 20 would still drown in tidal wave pool between 1982 and 1987. Comedian Chris Gerthard raises an interesting point here when he says, Nobody should be the second person to die in a wave pool, because after the first person dives in a wave, dies in a wave pool, close the f***ing wave pool. I said this earlier, it's not hard! It's fair to say that some of these teething problems gave Action Part a bit of a bad reputation in certain unforgiving quarters. Some critics have argued that there was very little regulation in place at the time for such pioneering attractions, particularly the water attractions, and Gene was allowed to design whatever he liked and get it knocked up cheaply without the requirement to go through much safety or have a basic understanding of physics. It does seem crazy. I feel like this is something that you'd get in like some country where they don't really have like health and safety. But this is America. I feel like health and safety is kind of their jam. You don't know what you're talking about, do you? Except when it comes to prescription drugs, then it's like, it's on fucking you, mate. Just get, get on with the oxycodone, bro. Yes! <laughs> The signs scattered around the park declared, ride at your own risk, and they seemed to put all the responsibility on the paying visitors. If you lose an eye or a tooth, don't come crying to the ba- don't come crying like a baby to the management. Um, that does not absolve you of liability, by the way. I'm pretty sure. I'm not a liar. But I'm pretty sure you can't just be like, yo bro, at your own risk. Um, I don't think that's how it works, is it? In fairness, management couldn't be blamed for absolutely everything. One former ride attendant noted, Someone who dove into one foot of water, this is not the fault of the park. Another accusation lobbed in Jean's direction was that the staff were largely made up of inexperienced teenagers, some reportedly as young as 14, who couldn't really be asked to enforce the park's few regulations and who viewed training sessions as an opportunity to just piss about. Um... Honestly, if your training sessions are being viewed by your employees 
as a place to piss about. This isn't the fault of the employees, it's the fault of the trainers. Of course they're gonna piss about, they're teenagers. You've got to get them in line and be like, yeah, yeah, do you want a job or not? Because <laughs> you gotta pay attention or you get out. That's your responsibility, not their responsibility. Use your big brain. Come on. In fact, it's been suggested that the park was effectively run by underage drunk teenagers for underage drunk teenagers. Beer was available on every corner, and there was a pretty lax approach to the idea of checking ID. There was also concern that Action Park was placing incredible strain on local medical services, with some hospitals claiming that they received between five and ten admittances from Action Park every day. There's just constantly ambulances. They're just on the, it's like, they take one person, they drop them off at the hospital, come straight back. It's like, where are you going? There's not even an emergency. Yeah, but there will be. We may as well start heading back there. Call an ambulance! But at least Gene was generous enough to donate new ambulances to Vernon to keep up with the spike in visitors to the emergency rooms. Yes, because ambulances are the big cost in medical healthcare. Besides, Action Park had its own woefully lacking infirmary. Unless one of your limbs was hanging off, you were more likely to get treated on the quiet without bothering the hospital or becoming a stat. There's no denying that Gene was running a massively successful venture that dared to step beyond the boundaries of a traditional theme park which dishes up the carefully or orchestrated and comprehensively tested illusion of feeling a bit unsafe. At Action Park, you really were in danger of getting seriously hurt and breaking a few bones. And the punters absolutely loved it. Gene wasn't overly concerned about the tragic deaths either, claiming that the number of lost lives lost was statistically insignificant. Gene, that's a little bit tone deaf, mate. Because when you're like, oh, no, 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 don't worry, your son's dead, it was statistically insignificant. That may be true, but it also makes you a prick, allegedly. His son, Andy, later backed this up when he noted the park admitted millions of people across decades, and we failed only a few of them. Although, it, you were sending six people a day to the hospital, what are you talking about? Great success. Nice. Although the park generated hundreds of lawsuits for personal injury claims, it's reported that Gene won 93% of the cases, sometimes by allegedly just refusing to settle and dragging out the cases for so long that the plaintiffs eventually conceded that there was too much pain in the broken rib to continue. And again, we'll reiterate the allegedly right there, because that is definitely alleged and not something that uh, someone would ever do, in my opinion. Definitely not, ever. Wouldn't do that. Gene wouldn't even pay out the lawsuits he'd lost until the police paid him a visit. <laughs> I mean, there is like uh, a mate of mine was just like, yeah, I don't know, some like someone will threaten to sue me. He ran like a, a decent sized business, and he'd be like, yeah, someone people threaten to sue you all the time, and his response is always like, cool. When I get a subpoena, I'm interested. <laughs> Like, I'm not settling. I mean, well, I consider settling when you actually summon me to court. And it was like 99% of the... It, in fact, I think every time it just goes away, he says, ha! <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ, the law. But hey, it's not like Gene Marverhill was a crook. No, wait a minute, he was a crook. For obvious reasons, Gene found it difficult to get an insur insurance or a genuine insurance company for his death trap theme park. So instead, he resorted to fabricating the existence of a bogus insurance company in the Cayman Islands. Wait, you can't just... Can you... I mean, you've got it. I guess health and safety was not a thing in the 90s, apparently. But there's going to be people looking at this and looking at your rides and your insurance policies and making sure everything's up to scratch, right? Because otherwise someone could get injured and then they'll be like, ah, oh, no, sorry, the insurance company's not paying out because in the Cayman Islands, they don't actually have liability, which is why insurance companies are very profitable there. I don't know, but you can't do that because of that sort of thing, right? He got caught out, but it didn't matter too much. Gene pled guilty to five insurance fraud charges. He was fined $300,000 in order to sell Action Park. Sounds a bit final, doesn't it? Well, no, it wasn't, because genius Gene got around the court order by not selling Action Park, and nobody ever chased him up on it. Oh my god, this guy is brazen. <laughs> Brazy! Perhaps Gene was just generally awarded special treatment by the township government because he had become such an integral part of the economy, creating hundreds of jobs for drunk teenagers and paying loads of juicy taxes. It's... It, that... <laughs> that feels a little bit like corruption right there, doesn't it? When Action Park did eventually shut its doors in 1996, you might assume that safety regulations and ever-mounting lawsuits had finally caught up with Gene and forced a shameful closure. But in fact, it was nothing of the sort. He simply ran out of money. Money. Gene had his fingers in a whole bunch of business pies by this point, but some of his real estate deals had gone proper pear-shaped, whilst the number of theme park visitors had notably dropped since the early 90s recession. His company Great American Recreation found itself nearly $50 million in debt. Oh 
Mai and could no longer afford to keep Action Park operating. But there was no grand finale for Action Park. Everyone was expecting the park to open again as usual in spring 97, but the dates kept getting pushed back until it gradually became apparent that it wasn't going to happen. Just like the kind of fun family days out experienced by so many of its customers, Action Park had not ended with a bang, but with a faint whimper and maybe with a slight squeal. In 98, the park was sold to Intra West, who got rid of all the controversial, life-endangering attractions, rebranding the park as Mountain Creeks. <laughs> they got rid of all of them? It has since changed hands quite a few times, and at one point in 2010, it was acquired by a business group headed by none other than our friend Gene Mulverhill, although he died a couple of years later. So his park shut down, he was $50 million a day, got bought by someone else, and then he ended up running the thing that he got bought by. Did we check about who owns the company that bought it? Did we did we look into that? Because I hope it's not Gene. <laughs> His son Andy took over the reins and very briefly brought back the name of Action Park, if not the original spirit or death count of Action Park. Since 2018, it's been sailing under the name of Mountain Creek Water Park and is now owned by Joe Hessian, who himself used to be one of Gene's young teenage employees pissing about or pretending to look busy back in the day. Well, that's kind of cool. That's a come up. But the diehard fans have argued that recent incarnations have been watered down imitations of the original Crooked Trap. Maybe it's time to bring back the danger and the wonky physics and the broken teeth and the spitting and accidental nudity and the fake insurance companies and the constant lingering threat of death. And whilst we're on the nostalgia bus, whatever happened to public hangings in the town square? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I kind of get, I think that if this came back, it would be appealing, especially in the days of Instagram and like pranks and all of this stuff, like people just like going out there to get injured and doing crazy <laughs> for views. I think this would definitely work, but also health and safety would be like, bro, no. And that's where we end today's video. Thanks for watching. These are the most amazing rides in the world. I love it here. There's nothing in the world like action park.